Welcome back to another episode of the Rankable Podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank, and I am so really interesting, maybe controversial topic today. I am joined by Jack Chambers Ward. He is the SEO specialist at Candor Agency, which is such a badass organization. I mean, he he he's taken over the he's well. So first of all, he's been in SEO for for five years, uh, podcasting for thirteen years, which we'll get into shortly. Uh, joined Candor in twenty twenty one. He's been hosting the Search with Candor podcast as well as he's working a core member of the SEO team. He's critical to what they're doing over at Candor in terms of SEO, um, and then also he does host another podcast called Sequelizers, which is all about fixing bad movie sequels, which I tragically, I have not listened to enough. And we were just saying right <laughs> before this, I, I need to listen to these because I am a movie geek myself. How you doing, Jack? What's going on, man? I'm good. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you so much for having me on. I know we've been working on this for a little while. And as you know, I'm a listener of Rankable. I mentioned you in a podcast recently, how much I enjoy what you do here, the interviews and stuff that you have. So I'm really excited to be on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, which is usually something I say to my guests. It's nice to kind of be on the other side for once. <laughs> it is It is nice. And, and we were saying too, one of the really awesome, fun things about hosting a podcast interview with another podcaster is there's so much, chem- I mean, your voice is butter. There's so much chemistry. It's so, <laughs> you're easy to talk to. Your show is fantastic. Speaking of which, two things. First off, absolutely check out Search with Canada. Go back to the episodes. Every episode has all these insights and you do such a fantastic job on your show. Um, you know, with you, Mark, you've taken over, but like getting guests who are a a range of diverse voices, super inclusive, smart people, like really smart people who are always kind of sharing really interesting perspectives that you don't always think about. And I love the insights that come away with it. The second point I'll get to is just a heads up, this is actually the first part of a two-part co-marketing multi-universe collide podcast <laughs> situation. Um, Multiverse is a pub- part right now, right? That's the total thing. It's be fine. People if people are like sick of it, are, are they, dude, <laughs> I, I, I'm a comic book geek, movie geek. I, I love it. But what I will say is there will be a follow-up episode on Monday that you should check out, search with candor. Um, so if you know, obviously you're going to come away from this podcast episode being like, okay, well, that was the best thing I've ever heard. I need more of this. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? There's more coming. But today, so the controversial topic, Jack, we're talking about starting off with Google biases, which is basically whether or not you think Google's results, the search results are biased. So let's kind of start there. Like, do you? Point blank, do you think Google results are biased? Yes. In short, yes. <laughs> Just straight in with hot takes. Because I think there's an inherent bias in basically anything we create. And, and I'm sure we'll get onto AI and a hot topic there as well and lang- language models and all kinds of stuff like that. But anything that is created by humans inherits the bias of those humans, right? We we can't help ourselves for, for better or usually worse <laughs> from my experience. Even things like training AI models on stuff, you find that it defaults to a particular gender or a particular race for certain job roles and all that kind of stuff. And I think Google, as much as they try hard to diversify the SERPs and make things more accessible and more inclusive for so many people, there is definitely... I've definitely experienced bias in certain directions. I don't know if your experience with your clients, Garrett, you would kind of agree with this, but you do often see like similar voices coming up time and time again. Is that just a case of them proving themselves as that subject expert and proving their, you know, double EAT and things like that? Maybe, but Google also say like, oh yeah, we don't rank TLDs. Don't worry about country specific TLDs. And then it kind of matters. And you notice that, oh, that competitor who has bestseoagency.com is outranking you. It's like, oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> well, I think I think to that point, first off, you, you call out the idea that biases comes in every flavor, right? Like every, it, it's almost like that whole concept. And we're talking about this with like AI a lot with prompts and, and, and there's this garbage in, garbage out. Like every time the way you phrase a query 
is going to influence the results that you get, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the the case of the language that you use. And I talked about this with clients quite a lot because we have quite a diverse range of clients in a lot of different industries here at Canda. And specifically, I work with five different clients, all completely different, completely separate industries. And also, it's the nature of the language that you think you're using. What's your ideal audience and what language do they use? I was talking about this. I did a talk about being a podcast host the other day with fantastic people over Captivate, fantastic podcast hosting platform. If you want to check that out, fellow podcasters, shout out to you, Captivate. And I mentioned getting the right tone of voice for your audience. I think that is even more true, perhaps, when it comes to creating content. That could also be a podcast, for the record, for your audience in terms of creating content if you're working on a website. Because if they're more knowledgeable on the subject, you need to tailor your content to their level of knowledge. Are you working as a top of the funnel introductory information hub? Or are you focusing on, oh, our, you know, our customers are already industry experts, we can dive straight into the detail straight away, and understand, you know, where you're going with this particular industry, you don't need to explain it step by step by step, you already know the customers are already engaged, they're already halfway down that funnel by the time they come to you and your products or services. The language we use for queries matters so much. And I think that is such an underrated and underutilized aspect of search that we don't really pay attention to. Obviously, everybody was like, Oh, yeah, voice search is totally going to take over the world. Uh, yeah, that's a whole other hot topic. <laughs> oh, um, my gosh. I, yeah, yeah. I think the way we search has changed and even we'll talk about this on the search with candor episode coming up where the whole like shift from forums and stuff. When we're talking about perspectives, people just putting Reddit on the end of a thing to try and get a direct answer. Like I want firsthand experience from somebody who has done this thing or used this product or service or whatever it is. And you know, Reddit for, for all its recent controversies is often quite a, kind of reputable source of people sharing information and they're they're usually quite tight-knit expert communities on reddit right if you want a technical support kind of thing or you're really into a particular niche like you and i being into movies garrett like there's a whole like sci-fi movies or horror movies or name a subgenre. there are thousands of people talking about it on forums all over the place and i think we're kind of shifting that way and i said we're going to bleed into our topic of perspectives from search with candor we'll be talking about but there is that bias, right? That the language you use matters so much. And if you're not matching the language to the language that your users are using, then they're going to feel like, oh, this doesn't quite match up to me. I don't feel represented in this. I don't feel, oh, maybe you have a, I don't know, a particularly large African-American audience that you should be catering to, and you're using non-inclusive language. They're going to feel prejudice against. They're going to feel that bias of like, oh, right, yeah, they're just defaulting to typical, you know, middle European white audience rather than catering to the actual people who are searching because we use different types of language. Me as a Brit, I will search in a different way than you in North America, Garrett. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so many good points. There. And, and it's funny because like one of the questions I wanted to dive into and we'll get to eventually is different examples. But as you're going through this, I just, in my head, am coming <laughs> like all these examples are coming out, whether it's you know, on the one hand, it's not even just subjective language, even objective language can have biases. Like one thing that I always come to is the query of, <laughs> and I'm a big coffee drinker, right? So it's like that query of is coffee healthy for you versus is <laughs> coffee unhealthy for you? Yeah. And, you know, we're still trying to get to that answer of like the health benefits or, or, you know, cons of coffee, depending on how you how you phrase it, you're going to see different results. And so that feels like it should be an objective, a more objective type of answer. It's not just like gender or race bias. And yet we still have that. I'm curious, and so many other answers come to mind, you know, so many examples, you mentioned the audience thing, I'm thinking about the recent example with um, Anheuser-Busch and Budweiser and mm -hmm. having a conservative audience versus a progressive audience with their advertising campaigns. And to your point, the way they would search for that are going to be those two audiences are going to search completely differently. And their content typically speaks to different types of audience bases. Do you see the same issue beyond Google, like on the large language models like chat GPT or on social media? I think it's worse there, if anything, from my experience. I, I touched on it just now where 
if you give, say, for example, like Dali or Mid Journey or one of those AI image generating services that use OpenAI and ChatGPT and now using GPT-4 as well, they do tend to default to, oh, it's it's a white male person. It's a male presenting white guy. You type in doctor, it's going to be a white male presenting person basically 99% of the time. You have to specifically go out of your way to say, I want this job role and African-American or of Arabic descent or Indian descent or whatever it is. You have to go out of your way to kind of specify, please don't just create a white dude because there's enough white dudes around, right? Uh, as two white dudes right here, Garrett, I think we can attest, there's plenty of us around. We don't need any more representation at the moment. There's plenty of representation around. And I think because Google, again, credit to them, like following up on what you were just saying there, they make sure they try to prove and diversify and make things objective. You, They want you to include pros and cons for your services. So there's the whole kind of establishing trust with your audience to prove that you're kind of a trustworthy source. You shouldn't just say, hey, come and check out my product. My Jack's coffee is the best coffee because it tastes delicious and Garrett's coffee sucks. Yeah, that's not an objective review. That is a very biased, very subjective review. And Google wants us to kind of prove ourselves as subject experts by saying both pros and cons. And I think ChatGPT, again, not having full access to the internet and all that kind of stuff, really doesn't do a good enough job of that, in my opinion. A lot of the answers you're going to get are going to be filtered through whatever zeitgeist is happening at that time. Obviously, I think it has the cutoff point of 2021 still for, for a lot of the Bing AI stuff as well. So you're not even getting the most up-to-date information if things have changed as language, as inclusivity and diversity changes and things like that. It's a It's a touchy subject, but I think there is, like I said, inherent bias because it is created by humans and the vast majority of successful tech people happen to be white men. So kind of, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, to that point, I think it is, you know, a reflection of society and problematic elements of society. Like the representation of Western society in technology is going to look different than Eastern civilization and society. Like that's really, just yeah. two examples. And, you know, like what we create content wise now as a majority versus what have been created 20, 30, 50 years ago, you know, what, whatever it's trained on, whatever the, the machine learning models are and the large language models are trained on, that is what's going to be represent, re represented there. And we need to your point, Google is trying. It's, it's such a, a, impossible task in a lot of ways. Like I know a couple of years ago, they specifically have been trying to provide search results that take color, you know, like skin color into consideration. Like when you look yeah, up a yeah. makeup, you know, related query, and it kind of leads to this idea of like personalization in search results, which we'll, we'll touch a little bit in terms of like perspectives um, on the search with candor podcast. But when you, you know, as a white presenting male, like, when you're looking at the results, what do you look at to assess that they're problematic versus, you know, anyone else? Like, how do you kind of catch yourself with your own biases? I try and step out of my own shoes and try and think about the kind of things other people would be searching for. And I don't mean this in like, a, oh, I'll go and imagine stuff. Literally ask people like mm -hmm. that. I think it's a huge testament to the SEO community. You mentioned earlier, like how what a diverse range of guests I've had on Search with Candor. That is a conscious decision from myself to be more representative, to make sure I'm not just highlighting the same, you know, dozen, two dozen famous SEO people everyone has had on their podcast and everyone has heard of. Uh, I've been working with people like uh, Chima and the FCDC getting voices from Africa in digital spaces and giving them opportunities to talk about their expertise and, and build their profiles up and things like that. I asked those people like, hey, if you were looking for this product and we want to work in this market, what kind of things would you be looking for? What do you search for? As a black woman compared to me as a white man, What what's the difference here? Like I, I, I was talking to uh, Jen Penaluna on my podcast the other day and she was talking about how she's now working for The Lowdown, which is all about women's health and reproductive stuff and menstruation support and lots of other things like that. Fantastic, fantastic work they do over at the lowdown for women. And for me, I was like, I have no experience with this. So I will, I will let you talk about it. And actually giving people an opportunity to explain 
it's easier said than done, obviously, because you can't just reach out to, hey, everybody of color, please help me like on Twitter or something like that. It's not that easy. But getting to know people and hearing people's stories and simply asking if you were looking for a new, I don't know, looking for a new SEO podcast as a person of color from this part of the world, what would you be looking for? That's a, it's a simple step. It's a, it's the little things that I think make a big difference. Just asking, just testing, making notes of that for future reference. So if a client does come around again and you have them in a similar industry or whatever it is, you can take that research and take the questionnaires or whatever you created before and get an idea of how to reapply that later on. Yeah. And, and to like, there's some things that we feel like we don't have control over i would definitely challenge whether you're you know especially if you're an seo but to use and they say this um like the the search advocates to use the feedback buttons on search mm-hmm. results like it feels like you're not making a difference but like reaching out to the danny sullivan's <laughs> of the world and actually saying like hey here's a set of queries like this is the results i'm seeing these are problematic you know for this this and this reason yeah it's worth it to just check that button what what are some examples of like kind of biased results or unbiased results that that have actually like struck you that you're like this is perfect nailed it or this is garbage so i'm a big nerd and a big geek i'm wearing a bucky o'hare t-shirt for those of you uh listening to the audio yeah (laughs) and it's things like that where i can feel again as a white man i can feel represented very quickly and i think there are moments where I'm just like, oh, you've absolutely nailed me there. I think that happens a lot more in paid than organic from my experience. You know, the classic like, oh, my phone's always listening to me and suddenly you get an ad on whichever social media of like, that was just the thing I was talking about, you know, around the games table or on on a call with my friends or whatever at the pub the other day, that kind of thing. I think that tailored kind of marketing stuff that you're able to do through paid search is a Good, really good way of reaching out to really specific audiences. I think that's much more difficult in organic, but it's still possible. I think you should still be able to push out the boundaries and try and, and push yourself. And there was an example I was talking with my friend, Sarah, uh, my co-founder of Neurodivergence in SEO, former guest on my podcast as well, Sarah Presh. Shout out to you, Sarah. You're awesome. And she was talking about how the way people search in the Czech Republic is so different to anywhere else. And you can't even get keyword data in that language. So even just trying to do her job as an SEO, most of the tools don't have the Czech language as an option. So what do you do? Like, I felt kind of privileged being a native English speaker being like, Oh, yeah, cool, I can get away with that kind of stuff. So as you said earlier, it's not just gender, it's not just, you know, race or color or, or religion or anything like that. Language is an element there as well. And you and I as native English speakers, Garrett, we are pretty privileged in that way as well. And yeah, just testing SERPs, just trying different things, literally putting in something like you would never think to search can make a huge difference. And I've had a couple of things where I thought, so if I was the perfect audience for this, what would I put into the search bar? If I'm looking for uh, nerdy t-shirts and geeky t-shirts, do I care about color? Do I care about size? Do I care about the brand? Do I want to be thinking about, oh, it's from the 80s or the 90s or, you know, that kind of thing. There's internet. I'm quite a big guy as well. I'm 6'2", like 260, 270 pounds, something like that. So having it in extra large, double extra large, triple extra large, those kind of sizes, there's size inclusivity as well. I know my wife is a bigger person as well. She talks about this a lot, how so much of like fashion advertising and organic search as well every model is a size four is a size six is a size eight it's like it is not representative and when people go out of their way to do that there are genuine results you know you 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 even get like link building opportunities as well not to make it all kind of like cold and yeah it's just to build links and that kind of thing but having a unique perspective and being able to provide that and tailor it to a specific audience to be like oh my god this person has built this specific part of their range of products tailored to this exact audience and if you're the first person to do it or one of the first adopters of this new kind of thing it can make a huge difference and i know my wife talks about that a lot when she sees accurate representation of you know the average size here in the uk is not a size four and is not a size six you're not representing the average british person in 2023 same again pretty much across the world at this point 
So having that moment of like, oh yeah, that that model looks like me for that product, or even even you know Google are talking about being able to try on those try on with AI, even though it's on models of a similar size and that whole thing. I think that's a step in the right direction. And I think having stuff like that, being able to, as you said, match makeup to skin tones and things like that. Rihanna has done an amazing job with Fenty of having the different colors. And now Rihanna is a billionaire and makes more money from her makeup than she does from like 20 years of music. So she's obviously doing something right. <laughs> that You know, it's funny. that That's the thing that, that annoys me when you hear in the echo chamber of like the Twitter bubbles that people are saying that there's too much content out there, that the internet is just flooded with content. Like, I don't think that's the right framing to think about the issue. It's just there isn't there there actually isn't enough content tailored to individuals or groups that is actually for the audience. Like, you know, and, and this kind of leads to my next question in terms of the responsibility on Google and publishers to fix the problem. You know, it's mm -hmm. almost like to your point about the average size person, same in America, you know, if the majority of people are looking for a certain type of content, you know, at, at the highest level, at the most generalized like head term level that represents them, you know, you would think that that type of content, if made for that specific search intent and audience would float to the top. Do you think that's on the search engine like Google to make sure that floats to the top or is it on the publishers to represent whatever like the actual average and and also you know all the unrepresented voices yeah absolutely i think it's a it's obviously a two-way street right we know right. this in seo it's not just oh google has to rank this thing i made good as much as google say just make good content that's like a running joke on the search with candor is just like well just make good content guys it's as simple as that says google every time anybody complains about anything it's just like well just make helpful content you'll be fine if you're not making good content, then you won't rank. And I was like, but my competitor is making crap and ranking really well. So how do you explain that? But to come back around to that, I think there, there's the dual responsibility. The, the content needs to be there and created by the publishers in order to even be available to index and crawl, right? So if it's not available to be found by search engines, search engines can't rank it. But there is the responsibility then. I, th I think it's something Google has been pushing along with their fight back against fake news and misinformation over the last like four or five years or so. That's definitely a step in the right direction. There were far too many pseudoscience nonsense and, and all that kind of stuff happening throughout the pandemic. And people talk about like horse tranquilizers or whatever. Horse, no, it's horse worming medicine, wasn't it? Or something like talking about ivermectin and all that kind of stuff. I think Google is making progress in that way where they're trying to filter out a lot of the misinformation. But that's not necessarily the same as diversifying the voices on the SERPs. And weirdly enough, I think perspectives, again, as we'll talk about on Monday, could be a way of doing that. And depending on how heavily they lean into that, this could be a way for Google to kind of, I think Mark talked about this last week on Search with Canada, to kind of shift the responsibility to be like, hey, that's a perspectives thing. That's not our problem. We're not. It's not the 10 blue links on the first page. So uh, you'll just find any old crap on perspectives. Just go nuts. So, yeah, I, th I think that's going to affect how people see things and people perceive things. But I think it's a dual responsibility at the end of the day. You need to create the content in order for it to even be there. But I think Google does have a responsibility to, as you correctly said, not only represent the largest portion of people, but to a range of people, regardless of the various different factors and differences between us. Yeah. And, and to kind of sum everything up, it is that challenge of SEOs of like to be the change that you wish to see, but also yeah. the fact that, you know, whether you're an agency or your business, you're running a business and you're trying to make money. And, you know, a lot of times content plays are volume plays where you want to get in front of the most people. And so that's where, you know, your social responsibility as an individual might result in in not the best business metrics and i think as a business as an agency as a person that's pretty much something you need to decide for yourself but you know i think both of us would agree that that 
we think there there should be a social responsibility from you know to to kind of wrap things up before we dive into rapid fire rankings are there any main takeaways of what you would implore agencies seos in-house businesses to do to handle the existing biases when it comes to google and search engines and seo there's another element here that we haven't really talked about, and that's accessibility as well. And I think that is something I have talked about on Search the Canada a lot. I think that is also something Google is pushing for, is diversifying the format that your content is available in. As obviously, I'm an advocate for podcasts. That's why I'm here. That's why I host Search Again. That's why I've been doing it for over a decade at this point. But having an audio version of your blog post or a video version or even both, just you literally, maybe the author or you get someone or, you know, you have, you know, a podcaster or a voice actor or whatever it is, find a narrator. Even doing an AI generator thing is not ideal, but it's at least a step in the right direction. So I implore all the listeners out there, all the viewers of Rankable to think about diversifying the format of your content. Some of my friends who are running sort of niche sites and doing real kind of like industry specific stuff, not only are they like reviewing the products and writing blog articles and doing new stuff, but every version of every article also has YouTube equivalent. It also has TikTok snippets. It also has an audio narrated version that you can click a play embedded player at the top of the article and it will read out and it says, this is a two minute clip. It will read the whole thing. It's a four minute read or it'll take me two minutes to read it. I have seen people do that in newsletters as well. You get the newsletter delivered to your inbox and then the audio version in there as well. Diversifying it, making it more accessible also gives you a bit of chance to rank in multiple places as well because we know how much video content is starting to rank on SERPs. Short video content on YouTube Shorts and TikTok and Instagram Reels and all that kind of stuff is starting to show up in SERPs more and more. And long-form video content does really well a lot of the time as well. So I think, yeah, the one takeaway piece of advice would be to diversify the format of your content and think about all the different ways you could be reaching different types of audiences. I love that. It's a great call out. And, you know, there's less excuse now than there's ever been before with all the technology and the tools in place, you know, that doesn't even have to cost you an arm and a leg to do. Not that that should be the main consideration, but you probably have a smartphone. So you probably have all the technology in your pocket to do those three things I just mentioned. You can do video, you can do audio, you can do transcription all on your phone at the click of a few buttons, essentially. And YouTube does it for you. Just grab the transcript. You know, there's so many ways. Anyway, (laughs) Jack, dude, I mean, this is hard when you have two fun podcasters who geek out (laughs) over this stuff because it's like, you know, and I and I say this in a lot of my episodes because I, I adore the guests that I bring on here and you are no exception. Like I could talk to you for hours. Fortunately, on Monday, there will be a follow-up <laughs> episode on Search with Candor. You should check out more of this conversation as we go over to perspectives. But are you ready for some rapid fire ranking, sir? I've, I was born ready, Garrett. I am so ready. I knew you. I knew you were. Okay, let's put some music up. Let's put the time on the clock and let's dive in. Jack Chambers Ward, rank your top three of something, anything that you love, man. Go. I love heavy metal, so I want to talk about my top three heavy metal albums of 2023 so far. Ahab and the Coral Tombs, Catatonia, The Sky Void of Stars, and Periphery 5, Gent is Not a Genre. Okay, there you go. I'm going to dive in. I'm not a heavy metal guy myself, but I'm open. I'm always open to new things. Rank your best SEO marketing win. My biggest win is probably sorting out hreflangs and international canonicalization on an e-commerce client of mine that they basically five times their UK traffic in a matter of months. It was a big, big change. They had US and Irish URLs ranking in the UK. It was a big, big mess. We sorted it all out. We sorted out the hreflangs and now they are ranking in the correct places with the correct pages and conversion rates are across the board up, which is lovely to see. Version race, that's the key there. I love it. Okay, rank your top three SEO tools. I am going to give a shout out to Systrix, not just because they sponsor Search with Candor, but I use them a lot since working with them. And I think what they do is fantastic. The data they provide, the insights you can get from Systrix are fantastic. Some of the best ranking, some of the best keyword data 
also asked again not just giving that a shout out because mark created it but it's a key part of my content strategy i used also before i joined canda that's how i found out about canda so i like to think i'm not being biased here but maybe i am showing my biases after all uh, and last of all site bulb for all your technical seo needs i know adriana stein mentioned that a couple of weeks ago site bulb is fantastic for just anything and everything that href flang issue i just mentioned sorted through sitebulb i discovered it all found out all the issues we crawled we sorted out we set up a tech tracker sitebulb is fantastic you a great list and it's not biased with the people also ask because it's like especially with the ai snapshot coming out like the also asked questions are so much more important to your content strategy anyway we could do a whole episode of that but i know you'll you talk about it. rank your <laughs> I'll, best I'll let seo talk about that one <laughs> <laughs> rank your best seo trick or tactic Internal links, linking from product pages to blog posts and vice versa is a hugely underrated thing in e-commerce. I don't think I'm focusing on e-commerce. I have a lot of e-commerce clients at the moment, so it's kind of where my brain is at. And I think people kind of are aware of like creating CTAs from blog posts to products, doing it the other way around and being able to give them more information so they don't leave your site if they come in with an informational intent, they're still remaining on your site and then can link back to that product page. You're answering every step of the funnel through internal links, through connecting all of your content together. I like that. Your content has to be good because it does feel like risky yeah. to send them away from a product page. But I, <laughs> I do. I think I think if it's good, then they'll come back. Rank. OK, this is one of my favorite questions. Rank what you love most about SEO. The variety of it all. You know, we've we've touched on like 15 different topics we could have spun off and do a whole other podcast about. <laughs> there is always something new to learn. Like I said, whether that's technical stuff, which is not my strong point. I come from a more kind of content background and working with people here at Canada, getting to speak to people like you, Gara, I love learning new stuff. And yeah, I want to keep on learning, basically. That's, that's my journey in SEO over the last few years, for sure. And, that, and that's the beautiful segue into the next question. Rank your best learning SEO resource. I think the single best resource that is a coverall topic for absolutely everything, the one and only Aleda Salise does an amazing job with learningseo.io. It is a hub and it links out to loads of other stuff. It's got technical, it's got content, it's got link building, it's got everything. I am so impressed. I've used it multiple times myself. If I'm not sure about something. It is a perfect oh is that the right way to do it i just need to just sense check myself and maybe you're working from home and nobody's available dive into learning seo.io and a lady has amazing tips and tricks across the board for that it's so freaking comprehensive and then the most unfair question rank the top one to three seo marketers that you most admire look up to respect the, okay this one is biased i will admit now because he is my boss and he does employ me but genuinely mark williams cook is an industry leader for a reason. I, f I feel very lucky and very privileged to be able to work with Mark on projects, on the podcast and things like that. I've learned so much from him. I was already listening to him on the podcast before I joined Canda. So again, trying to keep my biases at bay as much as I can. Uh, I think the most inspiring person for me is Ari Jabawali, the creator of Women in Tech SEO, now running her own consultancy with Crawlina as well. Areej like had people in tears at Brighton SEO back in April with her keynote and she is just incredible and I'm inspired and in awe of everything she does. And last but not least, somebody who really inspired me to get into the SEO side of podcasting, the one and only Morty Oberstein from Wix. Morty is the best. He is like the most friendly, welcoming person in, in the SEO community I ever had. When I first kind of like joined Canda, he was one of the first people outside of Canda to reach out and be like, hey man, great to see you. I'd love to have a chat sometime if you have any questions, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, Areej, Mark and Morty are just been amazing and really welcoming to me as I've joined the community over the last few years. Dude, I love that list. I adore all those people. Um, fantastic. And, and finally, to wrap it up, rank your number one cause or charity that you'd want to promote. So Canada has a charity every year that we support. We financially support them. We go and do uh, literally going out and helping build things and all that kind of stuff. It is a local charity here in Norwich. They are called The Hamlet. They are a disability center, special needs education center for children and adults, anyone basically up to the age of 29. They do incredible work with a lot of really, really difficult situations and, and things like that. And yeah, we're really, really proud of sort them. We've done a lot of fundraising and stuff recently throughout 2023 and we're going to continue that so if you can go and check it out viewers and listeners i highly recommend checking out the hamlet i love that you get you guys have a great agency i mean you walk the walk you care you you take great care of your clients jack this has been 
So good. Such a pleasure. If people want to find you online, what's what's the best way to get in touch? I am JLW Chambers on basically everything, whether that's Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. Search search with Candor as well. Come and listen to me talk because you'll want to be subscribed because Garrett and I will be continuing this conversation on Monday. So go and subscribe now and then you'll find me there nice and easily. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, if you if you didn't get the sense through this this best episode that you've ever you've ever heard of podcasting and you want the conversation to be continue, come Monday, check out the episode where we will talk more on Search with Candor. Thank you so much for being my guest, Jack. This has been an awesome, really fun, interesting conversation. I genuinely appreciate it. Thank you, Garrett. I really appreciate you having me on. My name is Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank. We will catch you next week. Thank you again. And I hopefully we'll see you Monday. Bye-bye. 